Hey, aloha everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, if you made it here for the live Q&A for complex trauma survivors, you're in the right place. Uh, if this video is helpful for you, I would love it if you give it a thumbs up. Um, any thumbs up or comments or shares or anything helps our channel and helps other complex trauma survivors receive the care they deserve. So welcome. We have a global community in over 180 countries that either show up here live or watch replays every single week. And it's very humbling to be a part of this online recovery and healing movement. And um, welcome. I just want to let you know who this broadcast is for and who it's definitely not for. Um, first of all, if you are a complex trauma survivor, complex trauma is abuse or an abuse of power that happened over a period of time, not a one-time jump out of the bushes incident. Um, if you've incurred sexual trauma that was a one-time one incident, then this channel will be helpful for you as well. Um, but this channel is for complex trauma survivors, and I am a survivor myself. I am also an author and a speaker and a coach, and I'm just here to hang out with you guys and answer your questions. Every week, Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Every week we have a new topic. This week's topic is re-traumatization and complex PTSD and the different areas of re-traumatization, such as being re-traumatized in therapy. What happens when we're re-traumatized and it feels like we start back over at the very beginning again? Um, are there things that we do as survivors that are behaviors or choices or circumstances that we find ourselves in that are re-traumatizing? And I guess the, the biggest question that we'll be answering tonight is, are some behaviors that can be ultimately re-traumatizing, are they ever helpful? Are they ever helpful in our recovery journey? And I'm so looking forward to unpacking this topic tonight. I'm just going to read a few uh, brief housekeeping items and announcements for you guys. I'm so honored that you're here. Thank you for being here, hanging out with one another. You guys are the most incredible part of this community. You all just hang out and support one another. So um, first and foremost, this is not for you if you're a bully. If you're a cyber bully, if you're a troll, specifically a potato troll, because apparently last week we got accosted by a potato troll and I was not made aware of that until after the fact. So um, any vegetable trolls out there are, are not welcome. Um, all trolls, not welcome. Bullies, not welcome. And if you're here and you're a survivor of trauma and you're not in a place to either receive support or give support, you need to step away until you're ready to receive support or give support. If you're triggered during this broadcast, it's not a time for you to traumatize everyone else that's here to heal. It's time for you to step away and get the care that you deserve by calling a crisis helpline. These videos are not crisis care. Our chat box during the live stream, not crisis care ever. So um, that's just really quick. And let me just read through if I forgot anything. Um, I really want you guys to share your wisdom with one another um, surrounding the topic of re-traumatization. Um, what you have found helpful during a re-traumatizing event, something that's helped you um, come down off the ledge when you're re-traumatized and you feel like you're stuck. What's been helpful for you? Do you have any grounding techniques? Do you have anything you've discussed with your therapist? Do you have self-soothing techniques? Uh, do you have uh, what techniques or tips and best practices would you like to share with our community? that would help other people who, when they are re-traumatized, they will be able to um, get in touch with that, that wise mind. And um, do you have any distress tolerance techniques that you'd like to share with the group? That would be amazing. I would love to share those here live with everyone else. You can simply tag one of the moderators, either Dawn or Matt. Um, special shout out to Jack. Thanks for doing the Storify and for um, just keeping an eye on all the comments. So many people are writing in saying how helpful that is. So I just really appreciate that. And without Matt and Dawn moderating and getting me those questions, I would never be able to do this. So a special thanks to Kalisha for running the Survivor Community Instagram feed. Um, she's the person who moderates and runs and sort of is in charge of the Survivor Community over on Instagram. And I'm so grateful. And to all of you guys who do research, who email me, send me videos, leave me voice messages, DMs, 
messenger messages, emails, um, send me cards in the mail, gifts. Uh, you guys, you guys are incredible. So I just want to say thank you to all of you. Um, this is for you, though, if you are a complex trauma survivor. And I want to thank you for supporting one another. You guys are the most important part of this community. You're the reason this whole thing is happening. It's amazing what is going on online with everyone healing together. It's just miraculous. Um, these broadcasts are not intended to be a therapeutic service. They are not crisis care. Uh, this will be triggering for you if you are a childhood trauma survivor, a trauma survivor of any kind, sexual trauma, childhood abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, financial abuse, ritual abuse, um, cult abuse, any type of abuse, the, this broadcast will be triggering for you. I want you to get the care you deserve, so please reach out to our friends over at RAIN, the Rape Abuse Incest National Network, R-A-I-N-N.org, or text HELP to the crisis text line at um, 741-741. They have staff 24-7, 365 that are there to help you. Do not seek crisis care in the chat box. And if you're over on Twitter and you're using the hashtag no more shame and having a chat over there, which is what happens every Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, um, or if you just want to go back and check the no more shame hashtag after the fact or during or before, um, if you're over there, please, please step away from the hashtag if you're triggered and get the help you deserve because you're worth it. And... Um, what else did I want to say to you guys really quick? Just, oh, if you guys could take a moment now really quick and go up in the chat box and copy um, the crisis information that I gave you. And if you could paste that and just share it on social media, either on Twitter or Facebook using the hashtag no more shame, or just share it in the chat box. Keep it on your clipboard so if someone's triggered or they're in crisis, you can easily paste that information for them and encourage them to get the help they deserve. It's really super important. So um, that I guess that's it. I just want you to know you belong. If you're here for the very first time, I just want to welcome you. It's just an honor to have you here. And for all of you guys that show up week after week after week, um, you guys are just amazing. You're helpful. You're 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 changing lives and. Some of you are saving lives without even knowing it. Here you are, you're in pain, you're healing, you're on a recovery journey, and all you wanna do is show up here and help others. And it's so therapeutic. And I just, you know, like high fives to you guys, because that doesn't happen on its own. It only happens with you guys and with your help and your love and your encouragement. So um, it's just an honor to be here. And again, tonight's topic is re-traumatization. I have a brief screen share that I will be sharing after I go through and just share some things with you guys. Um, it's been it's been brought to my attention that you guys really um, appreciate when I share practical, real life examples of re-traumatizing events that are that are that are in my personal life, not necessarily re-traumatizing events. Let me rephrase that. It's been brought to my attention that when I show up here every week and I share a little bit of my story or what's helped me practically in my own life and in my own recovery journey, that that helps you a lot. Um, someone shared that with me today on Messenger and then I got a few emails even over the weekend that are like, you know, Please share, when you share about your story, it helps me the most and it helps me feel like I'm not alone. So just blanket statement, you guys are not alone. There are entire YouTube chat, um, face, uh, Twitter chats and YouTube channels completely dedicated to, um, to you and the journey that you've been on. And there are countless people that are out there going through the trenches and just trying to recover from being abused as children. And and here they are. They're in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and they're navigating the waters of recovery. And it's affecting them in their interpersonal lives. It's affecting their jobs. It's affecting their finances. It's affecting their relationship with their spouse and their children and their friendships. It's affecting the way they um, show up at church or don't. It's affecting them being able to leave their home. Um, they are more acutely aware and just um, in tune with themselves in ways that they never were before because they're realizing that their trauma that happened 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago didn't just happen 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago and then disappear, poof, just like that. It wasn't a blip on the radar. It's actually still living inside their body. We have to actually process 
our trauma. We have to move through our pain. We don't get to go over it, around it, or under it. And here we are, we're all doing it together. So um, the idea of community is a little scary to some of you. And many of you have shared with me that you really try to stay away from groupthink. And you know, um, getting together as a community is sort of counterintuitive to someone who has incurred abuse um, in a system. Perhaps you were abused um, in the church, perhaps you were abused in a cult, perhaps you were abused in a very tight-knit family where you were the scapegoat. You were the one that everybody blamed everything on. No matter what, if you did everything perfect, you were still the one that was wrong. You were still the one that everybody blamed. Um, you were the one that people bullied. You were the one that, that they chose to put all of their crap onto. And here you are, and you're still sort of living that, and like you still feel that pain, and you show up in life, and somehow you keep repeating these same patterns. You're not alone. This is a real thing. And I'm just here to ease your mind and let you know that you're not alone, and then to just walk through how to feel better and what it looks like to move through a recovery model. I have a screen share. It's a recovery model. It's how trauma happens, how re-traumatization happens, what it looks like when we're in recovery, how do you know where you're at in your recovery journey, and we're gonna map all that out, and I'm just excited that you're here. So I'm just gonna check over and just see some questions that are coming in, perhaps answer a question or two, but I am gonna go ahead and I'm gonna share some things with you, with you guys um, that have been requested, and especially around the topic of can re-traumatization ever and and the behaviors that we take part in um, the choices we make can those ever be helpful even if they're re-traumatizing us in the moment so that's kind of a hot topic right that's something that everybody's like sort of mailing emailing me about and like messaging me about so um, let's talk about that let me just go and just check and see if you guys have any questions make sure you tag Matt or Dawn if you're over on Twitter using the hashtag no more shame tag song warriors so that um, I can get your questions and if you're on the YouTube chat box tag surviving my past and um, I'll be able to get your questions so um, let's see what you guys have to say so far oh my goodness there's a lot going on I want to say really quickly hello to Hunter, hello to Joey, hello Anne, hello Flower Song, hello Amanda, Heroes Don't Wear Capes, hello Jack, and hello Willow. Um, I see that you have sent in a question, and I am going to get to those questions. Um, I'm going to just share what I was already going to share after I take a drink of water, and then um, and then I'll go ahead um, and do a screen share really quick after I share, and then I will be answering all of your questions. So if you have any questions, please send them in, um, or type them out in the chat box, or using the hashtag No More Shame within the next 43 minutes. I'll be taking your questions until 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Um, Eastern, and then I will be spending a solid 30 minutes. Um, and maybe even more, maybe even before then, I'll start answering questions, obviously, because I don't have 45 minutes of screen share for you. So, But I'm taking questions until 7 p.m. Pacific and 10 p.m. Eastern. So let me just get a drink of water really quick, and then I'll, I'll, just, I'll just jump right in, okay? Wow, my hair is like extra frizzy today. Thumbs up for frizzy hair. Yeah. Um, so the topic of re-traumatization and re-traumatizing behaviors, um, it comes up quite often when I'm checking the email over um, no more shame project at gmail.com or even my own personal email, um, which is Athena at athenamoberg.com, which by the way, my my personal email on my website, Athena at athenamoberg.com. I have an error message that's popping up. Um, it's saying something about they can't verify the server name. And so if you guys have emailed me over the past few days, Athena at athenamoberg.com, and I haven't responded, first of all, there's a huge influx of messages I'm trying to get back to you, but I, I have an error going on. So not trying to be rude, doing the best I can to keep up. Um, but let's talk about re-traumatization, OK? So first of all, being re-traumatized in therapy is a thing. Um, it's something that happens to a lot of people. What does it look like when we're re-traumatized in therapy? Let's talk about that. 
So being re-traumatized in therapy can happen one of several ways. First way you can be re-traumatized in therapy is you finally get the courage up to get therapy. You finally get the courage up to reach out to a counselor, reach out to a social worker. You contact your insurance. You find out if, me if mental health care is even covered. You contact someone in human resources and you ask if it's possible for you to receive some sort of behavioral if there's a behavioral health plan through your work's insurance, it takes a lot of courage to reach out and to get any help whatsoever. It takes a lot of courage. So here you are, you're struggling. There's some stigma attached to your struggle because the root trauma is from 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so it's already not quote unquote valid in the eyes of a lot of people. You shame yourself for it. You're feeling super shitty. You finally reach out and you want to get help. You get the courage up to reach out to a therapist or a counselor. You go through all of the paperwork. It's two, three, five, 10, 20, 30 pages of intake paperwork. You got to remember everything from like your grandmother's social security number to when you started your period, if you're a girl or for, you know, when you, um, does anyone in your entire family, including all your third and fourth cousins, eight times removed, do any of them have hypertension or diabetes? And you have to remember everything, 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 everything. And then remembering all of that is already triggering. And then on top of being triggered by remembering all this stuff, you start remembering new things and you wonder if those new memories that you're remembering are even real memories. Or are they trauma memories? Are they imaginary memories? Are they fake memories and false memories? And so it's super re-traumatizing even to go through the paperwork, not let alone like even reaching out to begin with. So then you finish your paperwork and you finally get on the schedule. You have to wait three, four, five, eight, ten weeks to go to an appointment. Then you're like, do I even need therapy anymore? And you finally get to therapy. And then you get to therapy and you're waiting in the waiting room and you look around and you're hoping and praying you don't see anybody you know and then sometimes you'll see somebody you know like the person at the grocery store or like the you know like your child's like sixth grade teacher or something and you're terrified and you're like are they gonna think I'm crazy I wonder what's going on with them oh they were my they were my child's teacher like are they like struggling like no wonder my child hated sixth grade now it explains everything and now you're like re-traumatized just from being in the waiting room you finally get in to meet with the therapist or the counselor and you sit down and you feel like you're being judged and you're not sure and when they're being nice to you you feel like they're being condescending and that it's really not genuine and anyone that's nice to you must be trying to exploit you or harm you in some way because why because as a child when anybody was nice to you they were grooming you grooming is a thing Google child abuse grooming if you haven't there's a vocabulary word Harriet pop up the video um, or the YouTube card for um, grooming the video we did on grooming it was like three years ago or two and a half years ago I think um, but grooming's a thing. So already when people are nice to you, you already have like every hair on the back of your neck standing up on end because you're sure that someone's going to exploit you through their kindness. They're just luring you. That's all there is to it. Period. Right? Everyone in the world. Maybe not the therapist, but therapists can't be predatory, right? They have to all be safe because here we go with black and white thinking. Either my therapist is being nice so they're going to exploit me or my therapist is completely trustworthy and I can tell them everything and I am completely safe and my guard is going to be completely down. So either I am terrified that my therapist is going to exploit me or I'm going to let all my guard down and be vulnerable and I'm going to be hopefully really, really safe for the first time in my life and they're going to heal every wound that I've ever had, especially my attachment trauma from my mom or my dad or my grandmother. So let me just tell you, all that is already traumatizing. You're already re-traumatized. So then you realize that your therapist is a human and they have scheduling difficulties. Perhaps they're expecting a baby. Perhaps they're sick, you know, every three months and then you're not even sure that you're going to even you have to wait another month for your appointment because they're going to call in sick and then you feel like they've rejected you hello I mean abandonment much abandonment issues are a thing and now you feel abandoned by the one person that you thought was safe now what are you going to do nobody's safe so you retreat back into your shell for eight more years until you just can't live and you're suicidal again you guys all of this is a thing this happens this doesn't just happen to you this doesn't just happen to me this happens to people dozens and dozens and hundreds and thousands and dare I say millions of people every single week this is a thing so re-traumatization is everywhere and let's not even forget the five senses now remember we've talked about on this channel before the sense of smell is precognitive you smell something that's triggering you're thrown into an emotional flashback which by the way if emotional flashback is something you're not familiar with good lord I need you to google emotional flashback 
comma CPTSD. Don't forget the C in front of the PTSD. Because emotional flashbacks are a thing. So boom, you, you smell something. And you know what? The sense of smell being precognitive has something to do with PTSD also. But many people that are here on this channel are living with, with symptoms of CPTSD. So now you smell something, you're thrown into an emotional flashback, you're immobilized, you're frozen, or perhaps you're you know going off and, and verbally attacking somebody and you have no idea why. And then you realize a week and a half later that the smell you smelled was the same smell you smelled when you were eight years old and Uncle Frederick decided to touch you under the table at Thanksgiving when you were six and no one did anything about it even though you tried to tell and that's re-traumatizing and you realize you tried to tell but nobody listened and so if they didn't listen who else did they not listen to and and don't they know that you needed to seek professional help when you were six years old and now it's because of them and their neglect and the fact that they didn't listen to you when you were six years old seven eight ten thirty five forty 50 years old, here you are and you're re-traumatized and you're sitting in a therapist's office and you're hoping not to be judged. Are they safe? Are they not safe? Am I going to get better? Am I not going to get better? I'm just borderline mildly suicidal on a daily basis for about 10 years now. Re-traumatization is a thing. And that's only us talking about like therapy and your sense of smell. What about disturbing images? What about when something pops up and you aren't, you aren't expecting it and the color of it or something reminds you of a bad memory? What about like people's clothing, like the different clothing trends. I have clients that are super duper duper triggered by anything having to do with the 50s, like felt, um, penny loafers, jeans, leather jackets, anything that reminds them of happy days, like they're super triggered. They're just like, oh my gosh, they're hoping that doesn't come back again. And then there was this whole Audrey Hepburn phase where all the girls were dressing like Audrey Hepburn and then there's the whole Marilyn Monroe fanatic community and like then they're completely triggered or you know certain patterns on clothing that's re-traumatizing for you because it reminds you of something and let me just talk about this re-traumatization is even more traumatizing for you guys and for me because trauma memories are not linear they're not on a nice pretty little timeline with little hash marks with little years underneath them no trauma memories are like Bobby and I have talked about previously it's like a big pile of baklava and spaghetti all mushed in and you're just trying to find one piece of something that looks edible you just want to bite a spaghetti or you just want to bite a baklava you don't want baklava and spaghetti they don't go together but guess what that's what trauma is it's messy and it all touches all of it it just touches it just touches right now re-traumatization it it feels like we're going back to square one and it's super duper 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 frustrating. And it feels like we're failing at life. We're failing at life because we're re-traumatized. I should be stronger, I should be over it by now. Whose voices are those? Those are our inner critic. Those are people that probably traumatized us or re-traumatized us sometime throughout our life. So all of this is a thing. Now let's go back into the therapist's office and let's sit there and talk about one more thing that's re-traumatizing in the therapy office because I want you guys to feel validated right now. You get up the courage, you're finally sitting in the therapist's office, they're not absent, they're not sick, they're not expecting a baby, they're actually really wonderful. And they're listening and they're fully engaged and they're listening to your whole entire story. And then after you think you've developed this relationship with your therapist or your helping professional or your social worker, they say the words to you, well, is it possible that they were just being helpful or loving or kind and maybe it wasn't as traumatizing as you think it was? Are you sure that the abuse really happened? I mean, do you have a memory of it? And therapists and counselors and social workers and even some coaches ask these questions. Re-traumatization is a thing. It happens to a lot of people. So let's talk about, those are only re-traumatizing situations that are brought on by external circumstances, right? That's our external locus of control. We're going to an appointment and we're there and we do all the right things, but we're still traumatized. Um, but what about that internal locus of control? What about things that we can control that are re-traumatizing for us? Okay, let's just talk about me and people I know. Like how many childhood sexual abuse survivors binge watch Law & Order Special Victims Unit? How many of us binge watch SVU? Why? You ever wonder why? You ever wonder why we binge watch SVU? 
because it validates our existence. That kind of stuff really happens in the world. And if it happens on TV, my memories aren't fake or false the way people say they are. They actually are real. And there's other reasons that people binge watch SVU, even though they've been through trauma. Some of the reasons are because they want to believe that there are people out there in the world that are good and that are fighting for those who have been sexually abused and sexually traumatized. They want to believe that there's some good in the world. And let me just tell you that there is good in the world, okay? Uh, not everyone is as passionate as Olivia Benson's character. But, and not everybody is as passionate as I am. Not everybody is willing to be the poster child like Olivia Benson for childhood sexual abuse survivors. Not everybody is willing to be that poster child. Olivia Benson's character is, is, is proud and she's willing to be that poster child and she's willing to, to go out there and advocate for people. But let me tell you, you guys, there are other things that we do sometimes that are re-traumatizing and we're not sure why we do them. They trigger us or they keep us in a perpetual state. We're numbing, we're stuffing, avoiding, we're not really healing, right? But but can binge watching SVU ever be helpful? What about someone um, recently shared um, in one of our groups? What about Google mapping or doing like sleuth search? Like you are a private detective and you are sleuthing on the internet trying to connect the dots from your childhood, childhood homes. Perhaps if I could just Google Earth the home that my abuse happened, then the timeline would come in. To, to view, I would be able to see all of the events like ring, like the little the little twinkle sounds, and it would just be like ding. All of a sudden, we see the beautiful timeline with the pretty little hash marks with all of the little dates underneath it. All of our trauma is going to just be in a linear fashion. All the all the abuse, everything that happened, and we're finally going to feel like it really happened because we get a glimpse of our childhood home where the abuse happened on Google Earth. Okay, now. I hope none of you guys think that I am sitting back here and I am judging any of you from my armchair in my dining room making a video about this because I've never done these things. I've done every single one of these things. I am speaking from personal experience on all of this. And let me just tell you, re-traumatization sucks. And not only does it suck, but there's hope. And let me just share with you briefly how when we do re-traumatizing, when we go through re-traumatization and when we choose behaviors and situations that are, that we need to choose to validate our existence or to confirm or validate, did something really happen? And does it ever really help? I'm going to share a personal I'm going to share something personal with you. Really, really, really personal. In fact, I wasn't going to share this, but I'm going to share it right now. Many of you guys know that one of my main abusers was quite abusive and exploitative um, all the way up until my 20s. In fact, I was 20-something, my son was a baby, and one of my abusers um, set me up with, uh, with an appointment with somebody to, uh, so I could be introduced to someone who, was, uh, who knew a talent scout. So, because I had gone to modeling school and I had done fashion shows and I had won these awards like I did like pageants and I did this stuff and I learned how to um, I tried to learn how to speak professionally but I ended up failing and like the only thing I won was Miss Congeniality like that's voted by your peers like I didn't win anything else that was by judges because I was socially inept I was completely socially inept when it comes to anything professional now my fellow people that were in the pageant with me or that were modeling and doing things with me I was likable like they liked me I think because you know I could be I just sort of was like whatever I thought they needed me to be I was like I was the funny girl I was the goofball I was you know um, the sweet one the kind one I would sacrifice everything of me just to please other people I would always sacrifice myself on the altar of other people's approval that was what I lived by is what I was taught to do from a very young age so oh and by the way if you guys have not watched Richard Grannon's most recent video on Nietzsche you need to. 
um, because it he brings out some really excellent points, especially about that type of mentality, how we sacrifice ourselves on the altar of other people's approval and where it comes from and like just things to be made aware of. And I even commented on there a couple of different times. If you guys are interested in looking at that video, like go check it out. Um, pause this video and go look at his if you want, like seriously, it's worth it. Um, I don't know how long his video is, but like I made some comments on there and like I sh shared that video and I'm going to be sharing it in our groups as well because seriously people need to know. I digress. So what I'm saying is I had one of my abusers set up an appointment for me and, and make sure that I had childcare that day so that I would meet up with this girl who knew a talent scout and would meet with me and talk with me and she was a model and she was in like she was in the modeling industry she was a model and so she was going to introduce me to her agent okay her agent's name was Hal of course his name was Hal aren't agents all named Hal so she gave me Hal's business card okay Hal's business card was like one of those like dreary shades of tannish brown with black letters and it was that like rough kind of business card paper like the really like like it's just it was rough like like construction card like construction organizations like that kind of like rough paper not sandpaper but you know what I mean so anyway I called Hal and I made an appointment with Hal but I didn't want to go by myself so I invited one of my friends we went to go meet with Hal I was so excited oh my gosh I mean, I was so nervous and I did my makeup just perfect and I was like, you know, like probably starved myself for three days and I was so nervous and I brought, I brought my modeling portfolio, my, my photos that I got from modeling school that were professionally done and retouched and I brought black and whites, I brought headshots, I brought like all this thing. I was like, yes, like this is my thing. This, this is my big chance. This is Hollywood, Santa Monica Boulevard, like Hollywood. This is it. This is me. I'm totally doing it. Oh my goodness, and I was so grateful that my family member introduced me to this girl who was a model and then was going to introduce me to Hal and then I was gonna go meet with Hal and I brought one of my friends with me who was just like, she's drop dead gorgeous and she's beautiful and she's also a mom. Her, her, her son was also a baby. Well, um, little did I know that Hal was going to have us pose naked. But of course, that's what you have to do. Like, why would we say no? He asked all the right questions. He groomed me perfectly. He, he knew that I would comply. He like tested that over the phone just by even like, well, I might not be, I might not be available. I'm only available on such and such a day. Well, I'm not available on that day. Okay, well then you're out. Like I don't have time for you. So he knew that I would drop my whole life to go meet with him. So of course he knew that I was gonna, I didn't drive all that way. It took so, it was so far to drive. You guys, I'm on the 101 freeway in Hollywood in a little yellow Honda. Like it took, it took a long time to drive there. And I was there. I ended up posing naked for this guy. Um, with all this perfect lighting and 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 he assured me that it was safe because the pictures were only Polaroids and there were no negatives in Polaroids you you only like they were just Polaroids that's it so but it was very professional of course right it was a special little room with special lighting and you just you laid on this bed and and he took these pictures and you he got you in the most most favorable light possible and you just looked beautiful so then he tells me and my friend that we have promise and we look on the wall and the person's picture on the wall that he helped that got their start with him was Demi Moore. And of course it's true because his her, because her picture's on the wall. So of course Demi Moore got her start with Hal on Santa Monica Boulevard, posing naked with a Polaroid, right? How fucking naive am I? I mean, good Lord, you guys. So here I am with my Polaroids and and Hal says, we have potential. So I probably lost like half you guys. This is nuts. So anyway, he faxes, because there's fax machines back in the day. I mean, this is in the 90s, early 90s, early 90s. So he faxes these naked Polaroid pictures of my friend and I to a modeling agency that's just up the road. And he already had printed directions out for us. They were already printed in black and white and photocopied and he handed us the paper and he said, good news, they just had an opening. All you do is go here and then you go and you go up to the third floor and let them know Hal sent you, hand them this paper, hand them this paper, they'll know you came from my office. And good luck, I'm really pulling for you because Hal's our bestie, right? Because he's our agent. We have an agent now, we're models. So we get there, 
And we're sitting in a waiting room that's freezing cold. And it's very modern. And there's a leather couch. And there's this glass coffee table with a few magazines spread out on it. And all the magazines, of course, they're naked magazines. Because now I'm a naked model. And my son's a baby. And I'm doing this for the diaper money. I'm like, I need some diaper money. And my girlfriend's like, I need some diaper money. And we're like, let's see if we can get paid. So here we are. And we, they call our names. And we get to go in. And when you go in to pose for these pictures, for these people on the third floor of this high-rise building that I'll tell you about in a minute, you don't stand there naked, flat-footed. No, 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 no. Because it's a high-class organization. You wear a pair of pumps a pair of size 10 nude pumps that everybody wears. So I'm standing naked. I'm a size seven shoe. I'm standing in used public pumps, nude of course, because they make your legs look longer. And I'm posing naked. And I'm they want me to choose my stage name. What's your favorite flower? Where were you born? What street did you live on? What what would you like your stage name to be? Like, are, are you a country western girl? Do you want to be Sadie? Do you want to be Daisy? Is that your favorite flower? Where, where were you? Like, it's kind of like, what's your stripper name? Like, they, there wasn't Facebook back then, but there's like a thing going out, like a quiz. Like, what's your stripper name? Take the name of your, your, uh, child the 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 city you were born in and the street you grew up on when you were like 10 or something and that's like your and that's your that's your stripper name right so i've gone from being a high class model super excited to have an agent in hollywood to a little 20 something year old white trash girl standing naked at lfp which stands for Larry Flint Productions in a pair of used pumps, praying that they'll give me the centerfold with my friend for $2,400 because if we split that, $1,200 each, that's a lot of diaper money. All from my family member who was looking out for my best interest. Right? Well, guess what? You get 24 hours, you have to sign a contract. And within 24 hours, you have to, you have to, you have to come back in or you have to call, and they're gonna shred all of your negatives, they're gonna shred all of your Polaroids, they're gonna shred everything unless you come in and you sign this contract, because then you can get paid. But you can back out at any time within 24 hours. Right? Because it's legit, super legit. Look it up, y'all. Look up, look up LFP. It's a big tall silver bin, big tall silver building. I'm telling you this story, by the way, I mean, spoiler alert, I didn't end up being a nude model. And um, fun fact, the girl that gave me Hal's business card, she wasn't a model. Yeah, she was in the adult film industry. Yeah, I didn't know that until after the fact. And when I got back and I picked up my son, who I had, I had childcare arranged through uh, one of my abusers who set me up with this girl who had the agent, how who gave me the card and how I ended up on Santa Monica Boulevard and then at LFP, naked in some borrowed pumps. When I shared with my family member that I didn't take the job, they didn't speak to me. We didn't speak for like three years. I was, I mean, talk about a narcissistic rage. I mean, I didn't, I didn't take the bait. I'm sitting there in a car on the 101 freeway in a little yellow Honda driving back from posing naked in borrowed pumps at LFP, which by the way, they're the people who produce Hustler, but we, no, we wouldn't, we weren't going to be in Hustler magazine. We were going to be in one step higher than Hustler magazine because we were young. It's a magazine called Barely Legal because, you know, yeah because we looked, we looked young. You get paid more for Barely Legal than you do for Hustler. So there's a little background on your friendly neighborhood advocate that shows up on Mondays to do Q&A chats for abuse survivors. I'm telling you guys, grooming is real. 
And the reason I'm telling you this story tonight when we're discussing re-traumatization is because I literally believed that I made up all those memories and that none of it was true and I imagined it all because I couldn't remember like all the details about how and LFP and whatever and whatever and I couldn't remember the girl's name that was the mod like I couldn't remember it all in a nice pretty timeline so I doubted my sanity which by the way is what your abusers want to do they want you to doubt your sanity that's why they gaslight you that's why they gaslight you that's why they manipulate you and psychologically abuse you so that you'll doubt your own reality and not trust yourself but guess what super sleuth super sleuth here I researched, not only did I research how, I remembered the address on Santa Monica Boulevard. I found out everything about him, where his mother's from, what happened to him, how he died, how there was a fire in his building and all of his records got burned and it was under suspicious circumstances and how he's only a few miles away, his office is only a few miles away from LFP, Larry Flint Productions. And I even, when I was on the mainland, went there and I even drove past it and I remembered everything. The smell of the streets and the stoplight and I remembered where to turn. And you guys, was I re-traumatized because I looked all this shit up on Google? Hell yes, I was re-traumatized, but you want to know what else I was? I was validated. I was validated. I remembered all of it. And if you guys have to re-traumatize yourself in the short term so that you can heal in the long term, then I say go for it. I say high five, okay? Is it hard? Yeah, healing is hard. And re-traumatization is painful. But you know what? Not one of your abusers is gonna validate your existence. Not one of them. They're not gonna validate your truth. They're not gonna wanna listen to it. They're certainly not gonna give you the name of the people that exploited you. They're not gonna talk about you in a little yellow Honda on the 101 freeway back in the early 90s, wondering if you're gonna be some sort of porn star and like, you want to know you want to know you want to know something you want to know why I changed my mind you want to know why I shredded all of my negatives and why I didn't sign that contract and why I had them cut up all of the Polaroids and and why I finally realized that it really wasn't Demi Moore on the wall that, that got her start with him and that it was just like he took a picture that someone else had of Demi Moore and he just hung it up there and just claimed her you want to know how all that happened I was in that little yellow Honda 21 years old driving on the 101 freeway and I had a vision. I pictured, I had this vision, a very clear vision. I believe it was a complete divine intervention. I'm not shoving my beliefs down your throat. I'm telling you what happened. Because there was a miracle on the 101 freeway that day, and I'm claiming it. I had a vision of my little boy walking on the playground of his elementary school, and he was big. Like, my son was only like not even two years old at this time. My son was big, and, and he was dressed in these little corduroy pants and these like little shoes like that light up and and he was running out onto the playground one day and he was ran up to this little um huddle of boys these boys all standing around in a circle and he got there and they said hey jordan isn't this your mom and they were holding up a naked picture of me that is the vision i had on the 101 freeway in a little yellow honda back in the early 90s after I posed naked in a pair of borrowed size 10 pumps at LFP. So did I need to re-traumatize myself and relive all of that, not only when I was super sleuthing, but right now? No, it's not necessary. But is it going to set you free? Is it going to help you in the long run? Probably. I don't recommend super sleuthing and Google earthing every place you were ever abused and trying to track down all your people if you need validation from someone else. But guess what? Did you notice Did you notice the overarching feel of the story I had and the story I just shared with you right now? I wasn't searching for validation from anybody. I had it all in me. All I wanted to know is if those places existed. And the moment I realized that those places existed, I didn't need the pretty little timeline with the hash marks and all the little dates underneath. I know. Will my abuser that set up the appointment with me in the nail salon to meet the girl who was just so happened to be sitting next to me, who happened to be the model, who happened to have an agent, who happened to give me a business card, who happened to be all out of appointments and sorry, you're going to have to come on this day or no day. Like, 
Did all that happen as a coincidence? I think not. Now, is my abuser ever going to say, yeah, I remember those instances. I did set you up. I did send you on that appointment. I did want to profit financially from you posing naked and possibly becoming a porn star. Because why the fuck not? Is, is my abuser ever going to say those things to me and validate my existence? Hell no. Do I need my abuser to validate my truth? No. Because I get to sit here on YouTube and share with all of you that you all have a truth and no one's validating your truth. They're all wanting you to doubt it. They're going to be like, did it really happen that way? Was it really abuse? Do you even have your memories? Like, if you don't remember it all, like the way it all went down, did it really happen? Yeah, it really happened. And I don't need you to tell me if it did or didn't because I know it did. So I want to validate all of you and all of your truth because if you've made it this far in a video about re-traumatization and you're resonating with one bit of what I've shared with you, you're on your way to healing because while stalking your old abusers on Google Earth or looking at your old childhood homes or trying to find addresses to people that are agents that are going to give you a modeling career and send you to places like, you know, not everybody's going to be like this crazy Hollywood story like I'm telling you right now. All this shit is stranger than fiction. It really is. My truth is stranger than fiction, which is why I don't really talk about it because it seems like a stupid fucked up B movie. But guess what? It's my life. So all you guys have a truth. It might be in the backwoods of Arkansas or down in some weird strip mall in Kentucky or at someone's house out in Ohio somewhere or up in upstate New York where no one knows about it. And I'm telling you, it matters. And if you need to know if it really happened in order to feel better and to feel valid, then chase after it. Know that you're re-traumatizing yourself and know that you're going to be kind to yourself and you're going to have a hangover for like two days. Like you just tripped on some crazy drugs, okay? When I did all that super sleuthing and I went through that whole phase of my recovery, I was down for the count for two and a half days. But you want to know something? I planned for it. I knew I would just be down for the count doing nothing for two and a half days when I did all that research. I knew it was going to affect me. I knew it because I had been there. I know what it's like to be traumatized. This is just re-traumatization. So why do we binge watch SVU? Why do we super sleuth and look up everybody on Google Earth and try to figure out stuff? Because we want to believe that we have a valid thing that happened to us even though we don't have proof. We don't have DNA evidence like they have on SVU. We don't have our family members reflecting back to us that we matter and that our word means something. And we don't have people apologizing to us for fucking our lives up for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We don't have any of that. But what we have is that deep knowing that it mattered. And I just want to encourage every single one of you that while the re-traumatization is real and it sucks, and it might set you back, like two steps forward, three steps back. Plan, plan out anything that you know is going to be re-traumatizing. Give yourself two or three days afterwards. Be kind to yourself. Whatever. Eat healthy foods. Take a B12 vitamin. Drink lots of water. Sleep a lot. Practice good hygiene. If the shower's triggering for you, load up on some baby wipes and some mouthwash if brushing your teeth is triggering for you. Take good care of yourself. Practice excellent self-care after you're re-traumatized, whether it's sitting in your therapist's office and having her flake out on you and not show up or reschedule you four times or referring you out to someone else that's re-traumatizing, or whether it's your family member just choosing to not believe you and treat you like you should just be over it by now. Whatever it is, if you're re-traumatized, be kind to yourself for two or three days afterwards because it hurts on a gut, bodily, cellular level to have your dignity stripped from you and to be invalidated that way is horrific. So I'm a fan of yours. I'm cheering you on. I believe you. Even if your shit is stranger than fiction, I believe you. Trust me. Okay? Now, 
I want to answer your questions. I want to honor your time, but I just want to share a brief screen screen share. I want to show a brief screen share with you. <laughs> I'm going to share a brief screen share with you guys just on what the trauma recovery process looks like, and then I'm going to boom go into answering questions, and I'll answer as many as I can until 7:30 Pacific, 10:30 Eastern. Okay, maybe a little bit longer, but I just want to honor your guys' time and be respectful. So this is what the trauma recovery process looks like as per the Moberg Parish Trauma Response Model. And I hope you can see this okay. Um, can you give this video a thumbs up <laughs> if you can see it okay? <laughs> that would make my whole day. So here we have the anchor trauma up at the top left. Now that's the anchor trauma, if you're here on this channel, that is likely from your childhood. Not always 100% of the time, but 90% of you experienced abuse during childhood over a long period of time that wasn't a one-time occurrence. And there was an, um, an uneven power situation. Someone had power over you for a long period of time, whether that was your abuser, a parent, a sibling, a loved one, a teacher, a coach, a pastor, someone, someone um, had power over you, okay? And that's very traumatizing, especially if your needs and your um, safety and your, uh, your, you know, shelter, food, clothing, your, your basic needs as a human and your safety are violated over a long period of time. Um, this can also be if someone was the same age as you or younger. Just because someone was younger than you doesn't mean they didn't have power over you. Having, um, sometimes power is, is um, subjective. They, someone can be smaller than us, they can be younger than us, um, but for some reason, we obey them, and we do whatever it is they want us to do because they tell us that that's what we should do. And we fall into that, and it's something that we just that we do, okay? So I want to just tell you that even if this was only for a month, even if it was for two months, or, or even if it was only for a week, whatever, it doesn't have to be for decades. A lot of the people here on this channel, your trauma happened over over decades or months or years, okay? And But I want you to know that that anchor trauma is real and it shows up in our life until we process it. Now the first stage, we're gonna move from anchor trauma here. Uh, you probably can't see my mouse. <laughs> That's okay. We're gonna move from anchor trauma down. Now the first step of anchor trauma is usually denial. And it doesn't mean like, Nope, I wasn't abused. Nope, 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 nope. It could be that you're in shock. It could be like your trauma response style. You're frozen, right? You're frozen. You don't know what to do. And then it's easier to just ignore the fact that the trauma happened because you're afraid that someone's not going to believe you or you try to tell your truth and someone doesn't listen. And that's very, very, very traumatizing. So you decide that you're just going to move on. Let's just move on. Let's avoid that. Okay, so the next stage is chaos. Now what chaos looks like is when we have unprocessed trauma in our lives, we move into a chaos stage where things just keep happening in our lives and we're not feeling any better. Um, we're in relationships with people that remind us of our abusers. The chaos stage can last for a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, or a lifetime. We can stay stuck in chaos and never move on to recovery if we don't commit to moving through our trauma and addressing our trauma if we just numb, stuff, and avoid. Numbing, stuffing, and avoiding keeps us stuck in chaos. I'm going to say that one more time. Numbing, stuffing, and avoiding keeps us in chaos. We repeat the old patterns. We meet people that we find that remind us of our abuser. We end up in a relationship and we wake up one morning and we're like, how did I end up back here again? And that's, that's what happens. You repeat the chaos in your life until you stop numbing, stop stuffing, and stop avoiding, and you address your trauma and you decide and you choose to heal and address your trauma head on. And we don't avoid it. And we don't move around it or over it or under it. We move through the pain. We feel all of our feels so we can heal. 
when we feel all of our feels, we have a better chance to heal. So that's what chaos looks like if we're in, when, when we need to be feeling our feels. So then we move into recovery, and recovery is where we spend a lot of time if we are not intentional about healing. When we're intentional and we're like, you know what, I think I, I, I caught myself a moment ago. I was actually, I was kind of just numbing out. Like I, I wasn't even being fully present in my body. Like I don't know what's going on with me. Like maybe I should be like reaching out and, you know, talking to a therapist or talking to a counselor, talking to a social worker, talking, um, you know, with, with a trauma-informed uh, practitioner, perhaps a coach. And I want to remain present and I don't want to numb stuff and avoid. I really want to move through my trauma. I want to address every single piece of it so that I don't end up staying in chaos any longer. And then sometimes when we're in recovery, we can move back into the chaos stage for a minute and we can move back into denial and let's keep in mind that at any given moment, new trauma, AKA re-traumatization, takes us back immediately to the anchor trauma. So all those situations that I described to you, like being in the therapist's office or experiencing rejection or abandonment, anything that triggers you, that is traumatizing, re-traumatizing, that takes you back to your anchor trauma. Whether we like it or not, that's what it does because trauma is cumulative. It all builds on one another. So even if we're in recovery and we're addressing it, we're intentionally healing, I'm not going to numb, I'm not going to stuff, I'm not going to avoid, I am committed to my healing journey. I have accepted the fact that this is a lifelong journey and this is not a one and done. I'm not gonna read a magic book, take a magic pill, be in a magic recovery group, and have a magic therapist so that I can be magically better. We've accepted that, right? in recovery, but we'll get re-traumatized and it will throw us back. Like, gosh, I was so far and now I got re-traumatized and I feel like I'm a little girl again. I feel like I'm a little boy all over again. I feel like I'm eight years old all over again. This happens a lot, the new trauma, the re-traumatization. This happens a lot if you live away from home and sometimes you go home for like a, a winter holiday. In the, in the US, perhaps you go home for Thanksgiving. In the UK, perhaps you go home for Boxing Day, or you go home for Christmas, you go home for Hanukkah, you go home for Kwanzaa, whatever it is. You, you go home for some sort of a winter holiday and you're around your family, and you're re-traumatized. Your, things are brought to mind that you didn't realize were traumatizing before, and you feel like you're 10 years old all over again. Now, to get through that, you could be in denial, and just, just, just temporarily, you can mindfully be numbing, stuffing, and avoiding so that you can survive the, the winter holiday, and then you're gonna be in chaos for a minute, right? We're moving through the model now. We're in chaos for a minute because, hello, I'm around all these people, and I don't normally see them. I live my life very healthy, and now I'm back in this chaotic place, and I'm around all these chaotic people. I'm gonna be home soon. I'm gonna numb, I'm gonna stuff, I'm gonna avoid. Let me just have one more glass of wine because that makes dinner okay. I'm gonna have one more glass of wine because I can hang out in that conversation with my eight cousins and my four aunts and my two grandparents, and I, and I can actually cope if I have a glass of wine in my hands. That's that's mindfully um, numbing. <laughs> now, if you stuff and you go, ain't nobody got no time for this. I am flipping out right now. I'm gonna lose my shit, but I don't have time for this right now. You're stuffing. You're like, okay, I'm just gonna hold this in. I'm not gonna deal with this right now. Or you're avoiding. You're like, you know what? I'm not gonna be here right now, I'm gonna go for a walk, I'm just gonna get away from all of this, let me text a friend, let me make a phone call. Those are all healthy coping strategies if you're doing them intentionally. Now, if they become your pattern or your way of living, that can be a problem. So be very mindful if you're numbing, stuffing, and avoiding, or if you are intentionally dealing with reality. In recovery, now we're moving back through, we're back to recovery again, and we're not re-traumatizing re again, we're in recovery. This can be, you know, for a week, a month, a year, or a decade, or a lifetime. Now, not everybody moves on to reclamation. Not everybody reclaims their life. Or, like I say um, quite often, Bobby and I said, you know what, there's nothing to reclaim. You know what, Athena, there's nothing to reclaim. You know what, Bobby, there's nothing to really reclaim. I never knew a life apart from abuse. My whole life has been trauma. There's nothing for me to reclaim. You know what I'm doing? I'm discovering. I'm not recovering. I'm not reclaiming. I'm discovering. I'm uncovering who I really am. I'm not reclaiming anything. I'm claiming 
myself and my identity for the first time in my life. There's not even a reclamation going on. I'm claiming it for the first time. For the first time in my entire life, I'm not lost. I know my purpose. I know what I've been through. I don't need outside validation from anybody whatsoever. I am me like it or not, and I'm going to heal, and I don't care what anybody says, no one's going to take my healing and my health and, and my sanity from me anymore. Boom. Reclamation. That's the stage you're in. But again, you could be claiming it for the first time. You can be discovering. You could be uncovering, right? So there you are. You're in reclamation. We're moving through the model all the way up to advocacy. And if you're in a place of advocacy in your, in your trauma recovery journal, I mean, not your drone. <laughs> that was a slip, right? Trauma recovery journal. We need a journal, don't we? Um, journaling totally helps. But that was like a few weeks back when I didn't have any Wi-Fi and we went on a field trip. So if when, now if you move up into advocacy and, and we're moving through the model and we're to the top right little planet in the solar system of our recovery journey and we're in advocacy, how do we know if we are in advocacy? How do we know if we are on the planet up there moving through the solar system in the top right green planet? How do we know if we're on the planet of advocacy? I'll tell you how you know. You are sharing on social. You're tweeting out. You're sharing stuff on Facebook. You're on Pinterest. You're, you're in support groups. You're helping other people. You're telling people, I'll sit with you during this. Are you okay? I'm a safe person for you to talk to. I'm a person that you can come to. And you're speaking out. You're writing blog posts. You're making videos. You're deciding that you want to help other people get through and get past what you have been through and what you're moving past. That's advocacy. Now, your friendly neighborhood advocate here making this video, I get re-traumatized all the time. And then boom, it moves me back to my anchor trauma. I'm in a minute of denial. I move into chaos for who knows how long, maybe a day or a week. And then, you know, I'm back into recovery and I'm like, you know what? I'm embracing this. This is a lifelong journey. I'm okay. You know what? I'm reclaiming my life. Screw that noise. I am me. It's okay. It happened. I don't need anybody else's help. I don't need my abusers to validate me. I'm okay. And you know what? I'm going to move on because advocacy is my life's work. And this is my legacy. And this is what I'm going to do with my life. And this is the memory that I'm going to leave for my grandbabies and my great grandbabies and anybody else watching this video all the way down the road in 2030, 2060 or in the year 3000. Who knows if any of these are even going to stay there. But I'm just saying, you guys, that is what trauma recovery looks like. That's the map. That's the model. Screenshot this on your smartphone. Screenshot this on your tablet. Email this to yourself. Share it on social. Um, obviously, give give credit to Bobby Parrish and myself. It's the Moberg Parish Trauma Response Model. And I'm just grateful that you all are here and that I got a chance to share that with you because, you guys, just having a map is so helpful. And I know we made that map. We made that little solar system thing like way back in 2014, and we haven't really updated the verbiage down at the bottom or anything like that. So um, if it's dated and, you know, you need um, something updated – Sometime within the next like several months or maybe in 2018, maybe I'll update it and update the language and stuff. But you know what? Just draw one up for, in pencil or pen if you don't have a screenshot, okay? If you're on a, a PC and you're not tech savvy, draw some little planets, rewind this video, pause it, and draw yourself a little solar system and put where you're at. And But don't put it in pen. When you put where you're at in that little solar system in the trauma recovery model, put it in pencil because you're not going to stay there. This is a journey. This is a lifelong journey, and I believe your story, no matter how strange it is. So that's re-traumatization. There's much more that I could share. This could be an entire weekend workshop, quite honestly. But I want to answer your questions, and I'm going to answer them as quickly as I can, even though I... I say that, but I don't want to ever rush through your questions. So if I don't get to all of them, then after this video is done being live and it goes on into archives, post your questions in the comments. Like, save your questions if I don't answer them and post it in the comment section of the video after the live broadcast because all the stuff you're, you're doing right now, if you're here live, which by the way, thumbs up, give yourself a thumbs up, give this video a thumbs up, but um, none of this gets saved. 
all the live chats. I never get to see any of it. <laughs> I only get to see the comments. So save your questions if I don't get to them. I'm going to go and I'm going to take as much time as I need for the next 22 to 30 minutes and I'm going to answer all your guys' questions that I can possibly get to. So thanks for, for being here and for just being amazing and for being kind. You know, no bullies allowed. Thanks for keeping the trolls at bay, everybody, vegetable trolls and otherwise. Um, Hunter says, hi, Athena. I find nightmares containing secondary threats of the same abuse I already suffered very re-traumatizing. How do I not lose the next day to child mode? Oh, great question, Hunter. So first of all, high five, and thank you for asking this question. So I want to address how do I not lose the next day to child mode? I want to ask you to be kind to yourself, and I want you to perhaps reframe it and say, if I lose the next day or two to child mode, I'm committed to being kind to me because I matter. Because I'm telling you right now, Hunter, those dreams you're having, the nightmares you're having, they are real. They, they feel like it's happening again, and they, they feel like you're never going to get past it. And you deserve to hold a safe space for yourself and to be able to process and to, and to be kind to yourself and like, I am safe and it was just a dream. But even though it was just a dream and I'm safe, it was scary. And when children are scared, we don't say, oh, quit your crying. I'll give you something to cry about. Suck it up, buttercup, and go to school. We don't talk to kids that way. No, we say, come here. I'll... I'll sit with you. I'll give give me a hug. It's okay. It's not real. I'll keep you safe. I'll keep you safe. The the, the dreams aren't going to get you. You can you can come and, and lay with me until you fall asleep. It's going to be okay. And that's how we treat children. When my son would have a, a scary dream or anything, I would tell him to come lay with me whenever he needed to, for as long as he needed to. There was never my room was never off limits, ever. So. I want to encourage you to make sure that your room is never off limits to that younger version of you that might be afraid. Um, because those threats that come in the form of nightmares or smells or anything, like those threats that we feel are really real, our brain processes emotional pain the same way it processes physical pain. And that's important to keep in mind. You know, our feelings and our fears are valid. So I hope that was helpful, Hunter. And, you know, if it takes a day or it takes two days and, and perhaps you're in a situation when you're like, I cannot be in child mode all day tomorrow. Like, I, got, I have to adult. Adulting is mandatory tomorrow. Then do something really kind for your younger version of you. What was your favorite food? You know, did you like um, the little raspberry Twinkies with the coconut on the outside and the, and the white gooey in the middle? Like, go get some zingers or, you know, go get yourself a ding dong or go, like, um, I don't know, like, just be kind to you. Read your favorite story, something that was a favorite story of yours. Play your favorite video game or look at some memes online or go onto Pinterest or on Google Images and look up your favorite video game images, like screenshots of people playing your favorite video game. Something that's soothing and not triggering. Whatever is soothing to you, do that and be committed to doing that until you feel better or give yourself a time limit. I'm going to do this for 15 minutes because I deserve that and my younger version of me deserves that. So I hope that was helpful. Joey says, when someone like my family tells me that it is my fault and just to get over it, it re-traumatizes me and then I have self-doubt and I second guess myself. Oh, Joey, I do the same thing. I've done this. I do the same thing. It's very re-traumatizing when someone tells me something is my fault. Uh, it doesn't happen as much anymore because I'm, I'm low contact or no contact with 100% of the toxic people in my life. Um, but when I was still in contact with um, the, the, the toxic people in my family of origin, oh, just thinking about it gives me a stomach ache. So what you're feeling is real, and I have gone through the exact same thing, Joey, and I just hope you'll be kind to yourself and just be gentle with yourself during those times. John Harvey says, um, question, how do you keep yourself from being re-traumatized in a sexual relationship with your mate? The, oh, this is such a good question. So the only way that I have found to keep from being re-traumatized 
in a sexual situation is by having clear, open, transparent communication with my partner. So example, um, early on in my marriage, my husband, we waited. We didn't have sex before we were married. We wanted to wait. Like I was like, come hell or high water, I am reclaiming my purity. I'm reclaiming my innocence. It was stolen from me. It was exploited. It was taken from me. But you know what? I'm an adult now, and I'm going to wait. I'm not going to be with anybody sexually for as long as I want. And I'm going to wait till I'm married because that's what I want. That's what I want to do. It's my body and I want to have a say. And so I waited. And so I had all these visions of grandeur. Like it's going to be so amazing. It's going to be so awesome. Like, you know, when we're married and we're going to be able to have sex. It's going to be so amazing. I can't wait. And then it just was triggering and it was different and I was freaked out and I just felt so terrible and I was like so traumatized the only thing that helped is sitting down and just sharing with my husband like I am so devastated right now like and I would just weep and cry and he felt terrible because he's like you're just crying I don't know what to do you know but I mean nothing is too big and nothing is unsolvable if you are two adults in a relationship committed to sitting and having an uh, open, honest, vulnerable dialogue about your trauma. And sometimes there needs to be a third party. I have moderated. I have been kind of a, a third party, like, you know, um, I've been an unbiased third party to a lot of conversations with a lot of my clients, with their sexual partners, their spouses. And just because they needed me to sort of bolster their their strength, they needed me there. Like they did the talking, but I was there, and I got to. I was almost like a safe person, and like they knew that if I was there, that their partner would be open to listening, and it was safe communication. And I got to tell you, great results. So I hope that helps, John Harvey. I want to. I want to encourage you and tell you that it's worked for me. I didn't need a third party because I got my husband to a place where he was able to just listen to me even though I was bawling and I finally got to a place where I wasn't bawling. Um, and he's, you know, it's taken us seven years, <laughs> but we talk more openly now and we're able to discuss these things and, you know, there is enjoyable sex in marriage or, you know, there is enjoyable sex after childhood sexual abuse. There just is. Um, is it, does it happen quick and fast and awesome? And is it just no healing involved and you just jump in and everything just works itself out? No, like that's not the case. There's a lot of talk and, 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 you know, we have these romanticized uh, versions of sexual relationships that are given to us by Hollywood, um, you know, where it's spontaneous and, you know, it's uh, like a movie and there's no planning involved and like, that's kind of not realistic when you have sexual trauma as a child. Like for my husband and I, we, we, I need to communicate with him ahead of time. Like this is what would be the best situation for me. Like this is the time of day that would be best for me. I want to make sure that, you know, my, my hair is washed and my hair is dry. I want to make sure that I shave my legs right. I want to make sure that I'm not feeling triggered. I want to make sure that I've eaten well. I want to make sure I'm well rested. Like, and it takes the spontaneity out of it. And it's like, I'm not trying to like burst your bubble and say you're never going to have spontaneous, amazing sex, but because you might. But for me, I need to know that I feel safe and that I feel confident. And I also have body image issues. So we're talking about a girl with body dysmorphia with who lived with an eating disorder for most of her life and who's recovering from an eating disorder and who lives with body dysmorphia now and who also has sexual trauma. Like, hello. That's like... A whole bunch of issues and so for me to have spontaneous amazing perfect sex is not really realistic right now in this stage of my recovery journey and I'm not going to set myself up for failure by putting these unrealistic expectations on myself of like I need to like look this way and my body has to look this way and my husband has to talk this way and I don't want his stubble to scratch my face because that's very triggering for me and I don't want him to touch me here or I don't want him to smell this way or act that way or talk that way and everything has to be perfect. Like no one can perform under those 
like regulations and standards and circumstances. Like my poor husband would have like performance anxiety probably if I put all that on him. So we just talk about things like in an adult way that's very healthy and we, we try to plan it and, you know, like create the, uh, an ambiance of, um, of affection, warmth, and encouragement. It's the, um, I read this book. It's by Jim Burns, Jim and Kathy Burns, and it's called Closer. And it's um, intimacy in your relationship, in intimacy in marriage through affection, warmth, and encouragement. And so being affectionate in the way that your partner um um, can receive your affection warm meaning not cold and not like feeling distant like warm meaning like close and welcoming and then encouragement meaning like you're being encouraging towards your partner and you're encouraging an environment um, of, of where they feel safe and there's a whole section in the back of this particular book by Jim Burns it's called closer there's a section in the back where one of the discussion questions is my wife was sexually abused as a child and we're dealing with some intimacy issues in our marriage can you help us with that like he literally has a section in the book that discusses healing sexual trauma in childhood so like it's a thing you know so um, a lot of communication a lot of planning, a lot of encouragement, and I don't want to forget this part, John Harvey, a lot of trial and error. It's not ever going to be perfect on the first time. You're going to have to try. I know none of this is like sounding super fun, like, oh boy, like I got to like, you know, like fail a whole bunch of times, but you know what? Don't consider it failure. Consider it, you know, you're one step closer to having that um, healthy sexual relationship that you really, really, really want and that your partner really wants. And I want to just say this as a disclaimer. I wasn't planning on saying this, but I really just feel like in my heart, I just want to say this. Prior to being with my husband, I didn't have a lot of sober sexual intercourse. I numbed my fears and my trauma through alcohol. Um, whether it was just one more glass of wine or, um, you know, or maybe I'll, like, let's go out to dinner and I'll have a martini. Maybe I'll have two martinis, you know. Um, I didn't really have, like, sober sex, really, very, very much in my life prior to my husband because I couldn't. Like, I, I needed to just be numbed out. I couldn't deal with the anxiety and the trauma. And I didn't know that that's what it was at the time. I thought, hey, let's just party, you know, whatever. Let's just have a couple glasses of wine and why not? And, you know, um, but I really recommend for a lot of adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse, if you're trying to heal sexual trauma, you know, be really mindful of your alcohol intake. Be really mindful of that. Um, First of all, for men, performance issues happen if there's too much alcohol in your system, unless you're taking medication for that. And for women, like, you want to feel good about the version of you that you're allowing someone, you're, you're being vulnerable with that person, like more vulnerable than you've ever been. It's the most vulnerable thing you can do is open your yourself up to your partner. And you don't want to do that in a state of intoxication only um, because remember this, remember what we've talked about this on this channel before. When you numb your pain, you also numb your potential. When you numb your pain, you also numb your joy. So even though intoxicated intercourse, intoxicated foreplay, intoxicated whatever feels super fantastic, it could feel so much better and even more once you move through all your trauma and you heal all of that and you're not numb. And I hope that's not going too far and triggering anybody. I'm just trying to be as helpful as possible. So that's just my two cents. Please ignore, take the best and leave the rest. Like ignore what you want to ignore from what I'm saying. Maybe you're like, Athena, I've had sober sex and it's not that fantastic. I really like having a couple glasses of wine and then having sex with my partner. It's amazing. Then by all means do it. Like Go girl, go boy, do your thing. But I'm just talking from experience. So I hope that was helpful. And Austin says, being ignored or overlooked sends me flying backwards into the past. Ooh, yes, 
And this is big. I've talked with my therapist about this. Um, I'm going through EMDR again. I'm more in the middle of creating safe space. And I've shared with her that my biggest trigger is taking the time to communicate something and being completely disregarded or ignored. And that's because I tried to speak up when I was little and nobody listened. So, um, Anne, you are not alone. Oh my goodness, that's a big one for me. Huge. Flower Song says, my question has to do with pain also, but more about meds. And do a lot of people with CPTSD have problems with them working differently? Ooh, I'm so glad you asked this, Flower Song. So, Flower Song, um, I have heard a lot of people, um, specifically people living with CPTSD, I'm not well-versed or educated in this particular topic necessarily. I'm just going to share with you what people have shared with me firsthand. And that is that things that are supposed to wire them out make them tired or calm, and things that are supposed to put them to sleep actually wire them out and keep them awake. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure. I know that it has something to do with our neurotransmitters, and there's a neurological answer, neurobiologically, what happens with, with our trauma because of our amygdala and our, our corpus callosum and um, the bridge being out through, through the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Like I know it has to do with all of that, but I'm not sure that I have a direct answer except for you're not alone and I hear this a lot. So definitely, definitely it's a thing. Um, I don't have an answer or a solution, but I know that you're not alone and hopefully there will be more research coming out like with an answer as to why. So I would be all over that research. I'd want to read it and nerd out on it for a few days. <laughs> Um, Amanda says, if you have been re-traumatized by a therapist, what does it look like to process that with a new therapist? Ooh, this is a good question. So um, I'm currently in the process of that, Amanda. <laughs> I, was, um, I was hugely re-traumatized by a supposedly trauma-informed practitioner um, who was going to be doing EMDR, and it was, it was horrific. I was a little girl all over again and there was no safe place and but the way the care was administered to me the problem was me I wasn't healing properly I wasn't doing it right there must be something that I'm not doing correctly and so that was even more traumatizing the fact that the therapist the practitioner didn't even own the fact that they didn't do their job correctly so I just had to walk away thank you no thank you and like to this day I'll see them like around in the community and I'm on very low contact gray rock. If you don't know what gray rock is, Google that shit. Google gray rock, okay? Because when you get re-traumatized by a therapist, you do not owe them an explanation for anything. You can try, but if you feel that you're being re-traumatized over and over, gray rock, no contact, low contact, whatever you gotta do. You do not owe them anything and you, have a very clear and open, honest communication and very deep discussion, very real, raw, and vulnerable discussion with your new therapist, letting them know, I want to share something with you that's very personal. This is something that's a really big deal to me. I really feel like I want to share this with you before we move forward in my treatment. Um, I need you to keep into consideration what I'm about to share with you as you map out my treatment. Um, and you just, you, you need to just, I, I would have I would venture to say that there's no way you could over communicate at this point. Let me take a drink of water, you guys. Hold on. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks so much. So yeah, over communication is is not even uh, um, possible at this point. I would clearly um, communicate with your new therapist. Ooh, here's one footnote if you can possibly swing it. Um, if you could write it all out first, if you're prone to crying when you tell, when you're, when you're talking and you're angry, I'm prone to crying when I'm angry. Um, I don't know why. It's just my thing. It's part of my trauma, my childhood trauma. Um, I cry when I'm angry. And so when I, tr when I try to share with my therapist how I'm feeling about being re-traumatized in therapy, um, I get angry and I cry. So in order to be as objective as possible and unemotional as possible, I wrote it all out and I simply said to her, it would mean a lot to me if you read all of that 
I, I need you, I need you to read all of that. It will be hard for me to communicate with you verbally. Uh, it's very painful for me, but it's important moving forward as we map out my treatment that you know all of the things that I've written out because um, otherwise I can't move forward with you. Like this is, I, this is something I need to make sure that my helping professional understands this about me. So um, I said those exact words and I wrote everything out. And I even wrote um, in big bold writing with like an asterisk in the margin, like this means a lot to me. I need you to make sure you read this before we map out my tree, like I need this. I communicated my needs. So, um, and you know what? She thanked me for it. So, I hope that was helpful. Heroes Don't Wear Capes says, self-doubt is my cue for re-traumatization. It tends to kick assertiveness and self-advocacy's ass. From family to therapists, discernment is so not my jam. Oh my goodness. Oh, Heroes Don't Wear Capes. You know what? Let me just tell you something right now. This was me for so many years until I realized that I was seeking validation from outside people and I needed my abusers to validate my existence and my truth. And this was so me. This was so me. I mean, the only way that I have been able to heal my intuition is through remaining in integrity with myself. Oh, Harriet, can you pop up a YouTube card for um, healing intuition through congruence? I think that's what it's called. I can't remember the name of the video. It's from like three years ago, two and a half years ago, two years ago. Um, healing our intuition through congruence. Um, the more I was able to remain in integrity with myself and just be me and just do me and not try to please other people, um, the more I was able to self-advocate more and I didn't doubt myself as much. But let me say this, heroes don't wear capes. When I come in direct contact with toxic people, I feel it physically. And I know I'm falling into people pleaser mode. I'm falling into people pleaser mode. I'm falling into people pleaser mode. It's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, this is not going well. This is not going well. Danger Will Robinson, Danger Will Robinson. And I know I have to like seriously get a hold of myself and I have to remove myself from a situation so that I don't fall into people pleaser mode. Because if we are people pleasing, we're not healing. We have to honor ourselves. We have to establish and maintain very healthy boundaries with ourselves and with others. And if we allow other people to dictate our reality um, and their validation or lack thereof is a reflection of our value and our worth and our truth, then we will always, always end up re-traumatized. So um, I have no idea how I just said what I said, but like rewind it and listen to it again because like that's exactly like I really, really want that to be driven home for you. Um, you're not alone. This was so me. And it wasn't until something just like clicked and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what it is. I'm people pleasing. And no, I'm not doing that anymore. You know? So um, I hope that's helpful. Thank you for asking the question and for sharing. <laughs> and by the way, <laughs> self advocacy. <laughs> And discernment were so not my jam for a really long time. <laughs> I had to take like a class on self-advocacy. So totally, totally, um, totally not you. It's not, it's not only you. It just was not my jam for years. So um, go you, though. I'm cheering you on. Jack says, can chronic pain keep someone with CP CPTSD more vulnerable to re-traumatizations? If not, just a greater frequency of triggers? Yes, 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 all the yeses. All the yeses, Jack, OMG. You guys, if there was even one iota of physical abuse involved in your childhood trauma, chronic pain, can trigger you and keep you on edge and keep you in a low grade state of not only like possible suicidal ideation, but like, like the, okay, I'm gonna describe this in two ways. One for women and one for men, or one for people who can understand what it feels like to have a lot of hair in a ponytail, and one for people who understand what it's like to be hangry, like really need some food. So. For, for girls or anyone who can understand the whole ponytail situation, for all you 80s rockers out there, 
have you ever had your hair in a ponytail for so long and you're just cruising along and like you're just whatever and you can't figure out why you feel so irritated and you're just like you just want to throw something and you're just like frustrated and agitated and everything's on your every everybody's on your last nerve and then something causes you to like take your ponytail out maybe it's shower time maybe it's time to relax maybe you just went into the other room and you don't need your hair in a ponytail anymore you take the ponytail out and you go <sighs> Yes. Oh my gosh. I wanted to kill somebody. Like, good Lord. And you didn't even know that it was because you had a po your ponytail in too tight. That. Or you're like cruising along in your day and you can't figure out why you want to just like throw something and you're just so irritated and you're hangry. Like you just need to eat something and all of a sudden you eat something and you're like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better right now. I must have like a weird blood sugar thing going on because I was just so not me. It just wasn't me. I was like a whole nother person. That, my friend, Jack, that is what it's like when you have chronic pain. Sometimes it's that dull ache and it just wears down on you. You just have no patience and it's just like a perpetual state of that. And, you're, and, and the only thing I can say to anyone out there living with chronic pain, a chronic illness, any invisible illness, is you need to know what charges your batteries. And the only person that can make that distinction is you. You are the only person who's going to know what recharges your batteries. If you're the type of person like me where you're an extroverted introvert and the only thing that recharges your batteries is being by yourself, incommunicado, go dark on social media, don't respond to anything, isolate yourself for like an hour or two and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, the clouds parted and the angels sing hallelujah, you feel a whole bunch better. That's me. Now, some people recharge and they feel super amazing when they go into group and they're like, they share and they go, oh my gosh, I feel like myself all over again. All I needed to do was come into the group and just say hi to everybody and just realize I'm not alone. And then they feel amazing. And they're like, wow, this is the greatest thing in the whole world. And they feel like themselves again. So the only person that's going to know what recharges your batteries and makes you feel better is you. I know that I need to recluse for like an hour away from the world, away from everyone. Even if it just means lying there on my bed and like just doing nothing. Or sometimes self-care looks like me binge watching um, Richard Granin videos. Or sometimes self-care is me watching the vegan food channel or like the raw, uh, Tani Raw, Tani Raw's YouTube channel and all of her recipes, like they inspire me. And like she can veganize anything and make it taste amazing and good and like you'll lose weight and like it's awesome. So like self-care for me looks different on some days, but I know that it involves me reclusing from the world. I don't recharge my batteries um, like on a deep, 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 constant level, like daily when I'm out like at church with everybody or at a restaurant with like surrounded by 30 people or like the other night we went to a function and there were 12 of us there and like those situations cause me a great deal of anxiety. <sighs> I breathe my way through it. I show up. I embrace it. I enjoy it. But how do I really recharge with my hair in a bun, my glasses on and just sitting like with no particular care about my posture, no makeup, like, who cares, you know, whatever. And maybe it's binge watching SVU or super sleuthing all the shit that happened to me so that I remember that, like, I'm doing all this for a purpose and I'm helping people. Like, self-care looks different on any given day. So, Jack, if you're living with chronic pain, and I know you do, <laughs> um, and you're feeling re-traumatized on a very, very, very regular basis and you're feeling really vulnerable, I want to recommend that you try reclusing for like an hour and just away from everything. If you possibly can, or even 30 minutes, you can steal 30 minutes to yourself. Sometimes, like I remember when I lived with other people and I had roommates like a few years, like seven, eight years ago, um, that was like, like the bathroom that I shared. And when I knew nobody was home, 
I, I would love to just be in the bathroom. Like it had a fan, so it was loud, and like I couldn't hear anybody, and they couldn't hear me. Um, I would take an extra long bath, an extra long shower, or I would just like sit there and like just, you know, send emails or write in my journal or something. Like I like just being away from everybody sometimes, and. I know that sounds weird, like Athena's telling us to go into the bathroom for 30 minutes. Like, no, you're the only one that's going to know what helps you. So I hope this has been helpful for you, Jack. Um, let's see. Joey says, lately I have been going into childlike mode when I'm really stressed and re-traumatized. I just sit down and I color, and I'm not an adult. Is that common in abuse survivors? Short answer, yes. That is so, 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 so common. And... It's really mandatory for us abuse survivors to really nurture and like heal that younger version of ourselves. And like um, some things that are kind of traumatizing for me is seeing the way children are able to like just do all kinds of fun, amazing things. Or when my therapist will ask me like, what did you do? What kind of toys did you play with when you were little? And I'm like, I don't remember playing or having toys. Like it was just hell. Like I don't remember any of that. And like that's traumatizing for me. So like if I can find something that feels good, that I know my little girl may have liked, then I just embrace that and I allow myself to do that as much as possible. I think I told you guys this one time, I went to Target and I walked the aisles of the toy section and I smelled like um, doll babies' hairs, like the little strawberry shortcake um, dolls. I smelled her hair or I just looked at different toys and like just the smell of certain things. Like I just wanted to just like, and I just did it for as long as I wanted to. I was on no schedule. I made sure. Like, that was just healing time for me, you know? So you're the only one that's going to know what that looks like for you. But it's totally common, and you're not alone. I promise. Willow says, is there any examples of statements we could use to navigate through using assertiveness in a therapeutic environment when it becomes re-traumatizing? I have no one to ask. Yes, Willow. Um, if you're in a therapeutic environment and you're feeling yourself be you re-traumatized or you feel your trauma response, you're frozen, you feel like fleeing, you're frozen, you feel like yelling or saying something, <laughs> or you're, you're frozen um, and you feel like, um, I don't know, maybe you just stay frozen, <laughs> whatever your trauma response type is. I recorded two videos. One of them, Harriet, if you could pop up the YouTube card, it's on um, self-advocacy. And then there's another one on assertiveness, I believe. I believe it's called assertiveness. So if you could pop up those two YouTube cards. I think I'm out of YouTube cards, but link them up below this video as well. But Willow, um, you know, just, just as a footnote, Willow, if I was in a situation with my therapist and um, it was something where I was feeling re-traumatized or like I didn't say something last session because I didn't know what to do and I was frozen and so I pretended everything was fine. But now I'm needing to address it with my therapist in my upcoming session and almost all survivors, I won't paint with broad strokes and say all, almost all, higher 90 percentile of abuse survivors, childhood trauma survivors, complex trauma survivors, they fear conflict. They avoid conflict at all costs. They sacrifice themselves on the altar of everyone's approval just so they never have to rock the boat. Ever. And I just want to tell you that that will hurt you in the long run. So finding a way to respectfully say, I need to have a conversation with you, Jane or Joe therapist. Um, last week or a few weeks ago um, or even six months ago, there's no, there's no time limit. When we were discussing this particular situation, I was feeling this way. When you said blank, I felt blank. I think what I need in order to feel safe is blank. And then wait for them to respond. And any therapist worth their weight will own it and mirror back to you and say, so just I want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly. So what you're saying is when we were discussing X, Y, and Z, you were feeling um, afraid or you were feeling angry or you were feeling small or you were feeling triggered. And if I'm hearing you correctly, you would prefer moving forward that rather than me say X, Y, and Z, 
you would like for me to say A, B, and C. Does that sound like, am I understanding you correctly? They will mirror back to you so that you feel safe. They'll create a safe environment. So I hope that's helpful, Willow. That's exactly what I would do um, if one of my clients or even a potential client, you know, said something to me. Um, aside from the fact like YouTube videos, I mean, I get people all the time like, you said this on a YouTube video and it's wrong and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, I am sorry that something I said triggered you. You know, there was a trigger warning. My whole purpose of showing up on YouTube is not to trigger people. It's to share my truth and empower and equip others to heal. So if I did something other than empower and equip you and I actually triggered you, I am deeply, deeply sorry. It was not intentional. I own that. And I want to just, you know, watch other videos from other YouTubers or even ours. And if it's triggering, step away and get the care you deserve because it's never my intention to trigger you. So I hope that's helpful, Willow. That's all I can really sort of like role play out. Um, Poppy says, in therapy quite often, I am a comedian inappropriately laughing or stuck frozen, no longer able to think. All I say is, I don't know, to everything, both feel trauma, um, to everything, both feel traumatizing. Thoughts? So, um, Poppy, you and I are cut from the same cloth, girlfriend. I am the comedian. <laughs> and sometimes I switch from being the comedian to, I don't know, and this is why. <laughs> so um, my therapist reflected back to me something um, recently that was really interesting. And that is she asked me um, if I was ever allowed to feel real feelings when I was younger. And we had this long discussion about um, me needing to be happy all the time or smiling all the time because I had to be like on. And of course, there was exploitation and trading and all this other stuff going on as part of my trauma. And so that was expected of me. It was part of my role. And so I fall back into that role and my therapist told me that it would be helpful if I kept in mind that if I am joking and laughing and smiling during a situation that would normally call for more of a, a serious tone or a somber tone, that I should, um, that I could, not should, she said, I could be mindful that perhaps a younger version of me was present during that time and that I should be kind to her. Um, so just, I'm going to pass that on to you as a gift, Poppy, and just be mindful that if you're in a therapy session and you are playing the comedian and that was part of your grooming and that was part of your expectation growing up and you were never allowed to feel real feelings unless they were good feelings, um, then be mindful that a younger version of you might be present and that maybe you could take an opportunity to be kind to that younger version of you. And then um, as far as um, you flop between that and then saying you're sort of frozen and you say, I don't know, again, that's trauma response. And um, you, I believe, I think we've had this conversation before. I think you're a freeze fawn when you're in a toxic situation and you're in a freeze flee when it's a semi-healthy, would-be possibly healthy situation. And so if that's the case, keep in mind um, what we were sharing on a previous video, which is um, your amygdala, your left hemisphere is where all your language is stored, and your right hemisphere is where all your trauma is felt. And so if you're traumatized and your freeze trauma type as noted in Pete Walker's book, Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving, if you are a freeze flea, a freeze fawn, or a freeze fight, um, then, or if you just stay frozen, then remember that the language center of the brain is on the left hemisphere, the trauma is felt on the right hemisphere, and the amygdala has been hijacked. And so the bridge is out. There's no language to describe or to communicate what this trauma looks like or feels like, or sounds like, or is like. And so it's often the case that we say things like, I, I, I don't know, I don't know. Like a lot, especially like if people have witnessed a, a horrific situation, like a natural disaster, um, if they're in shock, they'll, someone will try to talk to them or get information from them and they're just like, I, 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 I don't know, I don't know. 
it's because they're traumatized and the, the, the bridge is out. The language can't get over to the right hand side. They're feeling this, the language is over here. All they know is that they're feeling traumatized and whatever their trauma response type is over here. And then their, their, their words are over here. So um, Heather Tuba, by the way, is a great resource um, about subjects like that as well. She writes about subjects like that. And um, there is Lori Gill, Lori Gill, L-O-R-I-G-I-L-L. -L. Um, she is at A-T-T-C-H dot org, I believe. And it's the Attachment Trauma Treatment Center Recovery Center or something like that. Um, and it's in um, St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. And she talks a lot about this and has a tremendous, tremendous amount of knowledge. Um, she holds conferences. And I got the privilege of interviewing her twice for World Narcissistic Abuse Awareness Day. So um, please research and look up all these things I'm telling you guys so that you're not just relying on me being your only source of information because anything that is learned deserves to be looked up and confirmed. Julie says, I was re-traumatized almost every year when my therapist decided to move to a different company. Yeah, absolutely that is re-traumatizing Julie. That is, that's abandonment and that's like shifting and especially if you like moved around a lot or you just weren't sure like the rules, a lot of abusers or toxic families of origin, the rules change and you never know what the rules are. You're supposed to just be psychic. You're supposed to just know everything, right? So um, if that's the case, please be kind. Please be kind with yourself. Um, it's hugely traumatizing when our therapists decide to move or they're sick or they change companies and it's yes I want to validate you that is huge Dawn says my therapist was concerned that me telling my story would re-traumatize me sometimes so she gave me the tool of telling my story like I was watching a movie instead of reliving the trauma as I told it my good friend also mentions this she says telling the story in witness mode yes third person is so empowering you guys um, one of the workshops that I've attended and in fact I've actually done this with a client and that is you you write a fiction story with fiction characters, and I'm using air quotes for anyone that's like listening and not watching, like in air quotes, fiction, but it's actually real, and it's you telling the story through the third person, and you're actually naming the main character, you, something else, like whatever you want the name to be, and you're retelling the story, and it's not as traumatizing, but it's very cathartic, very healing, very therapeutic to do this. So yes, high fives on that. That's hugely healing. Katie Lee says, I think I have come to the conclusion that I may have been re-traumatizing myself by waiting to be rescued. Yes. And then projecting it on every relationship. Yes, 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 yes. So many of us complex trauma survivors, we needed someone to rescue us when we were little or when we were going through our trauma, however old we were, and no one ever came. And so we somehow got to the belief in our heads that we would never be okay unless someone rescued us, which is self-defeating. And it is a self-fulfilling prophecy that never, that is, that is not good, right? Because no one's ever gonna rescue us from our past. Like we can't unbake the cake, right? And so what, what happens and what is hugely powerful and empowering, Katie, is when we learn to rescue ourselves and we read books on how to heal and how to be our own advocate, study self-advocacy like it's going out of style. Um, and it's really, really hugely, hugely healing. But I did the same thing, Katie. I did it. I, you know what, Katie? I did that in every single one of my relationships that I can recall. Um, up until this one and I almost did it with my husband I almost did it when we were dating in fact I was triggered by he put a cup on the on the counter really loudly um, I shared this before I think I shared this in the um, safety video like the first one we did or maybe it was um, crisis management plan 
or something. But um, he put a cup down on the counter really loud, and I equated that to a precursor to violence. And so I literally almost left. In fact, I think I was downstairs, like ready to leave. And one time I did leave. So, and then backing up a couple questions ago to Jack, who was talking about chronic pain, it's hugely triggering to feel physical pain, especially if physical abuse was any part of your childhood trauma. And I remember my husband, who would never harm me on purpose, um, he hugged me and like touched my back, like to massage my back one time. And he must, must have touched me in a specific way that caused me to have like a shooting pain. And it was reminiscent of pain that I felt as a child. And I flipped out on him and I'm like, what the F are you doing? Why would you do that to me? And I mean, I went off on him and this is when we were like first married or like in the first two years of our marriage, I think like, he's like, what did I get myself into? Right. So, um, it took me a while to explain to him like what that was about and where it came from. And, you know, I apologize and he forgave me, but, um, yeah, Katie, I, I did that in almost every single relationship, even when I was dating my husband. So you're not alone, um, and it does get better. <laughs> um, Rhonda says, when I'm triggered, how, when triggered, how does one move past the anger, hatred, hurt, and figure out what is needed to move on? Ooh, that's a great question, Rhonda. First of all, Rhonda, high five, and hello if I've never welcomed you. And um, if you are in touch with your anger, I'm super happy for you because a lot of complex PTSD or trauma survivor, complex trauma survivors can't access their anger. And in order for us to fully heal, we have to access all of our feels. We have to feel all of our feels if we're ever going to heal. So the fact that you're able to access that anger is amazing. And we're going to we're gonna find a way to help it propel you onto the next uh, level of your journey. So when you're triggered, how do you move past the anger, hatred, hurt, and figure out what is needed to move on? So if I were, I've been in that place where I was like anger, angry, traumatized. I was just madly in hate with a couple of people. Um, I allowed myself, I honored those feelings. Honestly, Rhonda, like, not shaming ourselves for feeling that is a huge step because what I would do is I would circumvent the process by if I would ever start to feel angry, it would immediately trigger into compassion. Well, they were abused. My abusers were abused as children, so they didn't know any better. And I would give them a hall pass at life. So I would move immediately into confusion, and I would move from confusion. Like, why, would they, why wouldn't they save me? Why would they hurt me? Why would they harm me? Why wouldn't they rescue me? Why, 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 why? And then I wouldn't be able to access my anger, like, effing a-holes. Like, who abuses children? Rawr! Like, I wouldn't even be able to feel it. I would move from confusion to, like, why? I don't understand that. Oh, my gosh. To well, they were abused when they were children, and so they didn't know any better, and then they would just get a hall pass, and they would, like, anything they ever did was okay because of that, and that is just wrong, 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 and it's natural, 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 so if you're stuck in anger, I would find a way to honor those feelings and help use them um, in a way that can propel you. Make some angry, amazing art, or um, learn how to... Um, go shooting at the shooting range or, or learn how to do archery or something that can help you get that anger out in a healthy way. If you like kick, like I have a client who used to love to go kickboxing at the gym and it helped, it helped. And I'm like, well, I'm not into that. Like, no thanks. I broke my ankle and my ankle is fused and I don't do kickboxing. Sorry. But I found certain ways that do help me process my anger. That's why I have this YouTube channel, <laughs> because when I hear the injustices that happen to other people and I go, what? Are you kidding me? No, that's not okay. And when I watch Law & Order SVU, if I ever do watch it, I, I get angry. I get in touch with my anger. And, and it's one of the only ways I know to help me get in touch with my anger, by advocating for others or by watching a television show about someone who advocates for others, because <laughs> it, it helps me. Um, step away from my own trauma and look at it on someone else and go, that is just not okay. It's never going to be okay to do those things to children. And it wasn't okay when it happened to me. So there. 
<laughs> you know, but um, if I was the type of person that wanted to go kickboxing or I could make some angry, awesome art or I could learn how to, you know, go to the shooting range or do archery or whatever, um, something that you find cathartic or therapeutic. That way you can channel it into something that's like for you because you deserve it. That anger that you feel is real and it's and you're worth it. And the fact that you can feel that anger, allow it to empower you to either help others or own something for yourself. Like, I deserve to heal, you know? Um, I did a couple of half marathons and I did one full marathon. I gotta tell you, uh, some of the most healing things I've ever done for myself. Like, when you accomplish something that not very many people are able to accomplish, you're like, wow. Like, this is for me. I'm doing this for me. And while, yes, I did dedicate my marathon, um, you get to like sit, they read over the loudspeaker when you cross the finish line who your marathon's for. I dedicated it to my son who was deployed in the military at the time. Um, and so it wasn't necessarily for me, but I look back on that time when I was training for that marathon every damn day, miles and miles and miles and hours and hours and hours um, of training for that marathon. That was for me. And I did it. And not one of my abusers and no one that I know that was part of my ring of, of toxic, abusive a-holes and enablers, not one of them has completed a marathon. So go me, right? So I don't know. Like, I hope that was a good example that helps you like understand um, that it's possible. I ran way over you guys. I just want to um, be like respectful of your time. I just will answer the last couple questions as quickly as I can. Heroes Don't Wear Capes says, I drove with no real idea where I was going, but I pulled up at two separate brothels I was taken to as a child. It was re-traumatizing, but I needed something to be real, and it was worth it. Yes! I'm telling you! Now, is it? do I recommend that all of the abusers that are here, or all of the, the um, abused, and people who have been exploited and traded out for goods and services and sold and forced to work in brothels. Am I saying you need to go out and do that in order to heal? No. Your healing journey is yours and yours alone. But if you feel like you need to find something to make it real and you're going to do it for you, then do it. Do it. You have, you have my full blessing and encouragement because... For me, it was worth it. And apparently, it was worth it for Heroes Don't Wear Capes. So good for you. I'm high-fiving you. Anita says, I'm starting to get to my psych courses on my path to becoming a therapist. And it definitely brings up some stuff. Re-traumatizing. How can I turn this into a positive that, at that moment in class or while studying? So, Anita, it's going to be really hard to turn it into a positive at that moment because every one of us human beings has a trauma response style. We're either like a freeze fawn or a freeze flea or, um, or a freeze fight or we're a fight fawn or a fight flea or we're a, you know, a fawn fight or whatever. Whatever our trauma response style is. Um, if you haven't read Pete Walker's book, Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving yet, I highly recommend learning about yourself, know thyself, and test what feels right to you. Above all else, Anita, in those moments in class, honor yourself. If you need to step away, step away. If you need to excuse yourself, to go to the restroom, do it. If you need to sit through it and just allow yourself a moment, then do it. If you need to speak up and share, then speak up and share. Do whatever feels right to you, but whatever you do above all else, honor those feelings that come up. Please don't numb them, stuff them, or avoid them. Please don't shove them to the side, and please don't shame yourself for feeling them because We've all incurred enough shame. We've all been carrying enough shame that never even belonged to us. So I hope that's helpful. And I hope that you will honor yourself. And good for you going to school to become a therapist. I'm so proud of you. Last question. Sabra. Sabra says, I see at least one abuser every time I go back to Idaho. 
I can't avoid going. Is there a way to lessen the amount of re-traumatization? I can never predict when or who of my abusers I will see. The answer is no, Sabra. I'm so sorry. Um, the only thing you can do is plan ahead. Like, what helps ground you? Is it a Hall's eucalyptus? Is it a piece of peppermint gum? Is it some essential oils that you rub on your hands like lemon or peppermint or lavender or eucalyptus? And, you know, you can just sort of like smell and then it will help ground you and you're, you know, you feel good. Is there like a piece of chocolate you can keep in your purse? Because sometimes chocolate is very soothing. Um, are there earbuds you can wear? Um, are, like that you can keep close by so that you can just put them in and you can listen to something soothing like a sounds of beach or ocean or you know meditative sounds um, Can you pull out your phone and like send a text to someone and say? Um, you know they're here I think I just need to know somebody else is on the other line over over there like cheering for me or praying for me And you know I'm gonna say this because I don't think that that it's worth leaving out there is power amazing power in having a spiritual practice I don't care what your spiritual belief system is but believing in something bigger than ourselves as survivors in those moments when we're caught off guard and we're able to just pray or meditate or be silent or read an affirmation or t have a touchstone like a like something on your ring like a like some like rough corners of a ring or like a little stone you keep in your pocket or a sound or um, a praise and worship song or a scripture or um, you know some sort of Zen thing that helps you you know get back into yourself and your high in your highest self a mindfulness technique there's something powerful to be said about a spiritual practice in those types of moments when you can't avoid toxic people um, just knowing that someone is out there praying for me or saying, you got this, I believe in you, and you're gonna get through this. Let me know how it goes. Just those few words make all the difference in the world. So I hope that was helpful. I ran way over, this is a two hour video, good Lord. I'm gonna have to change the thumbnail to read like two hour special so that people don't think I do two hour videos all the time, good Lord. But um. I've enjoyed being with you guys thoroughly. It's been wonderful to be here with you guys. And, um, you know, I believe you. I believe you. I believe you and I believe in you. And, you know, whatever your trauma is, sexual trauma, physical trauma, verbal, emotional, psychological, spiritual trauma, cult, ritual, Whatever your abuse, whatever your trauma, I believe you and I believe in you. And I'm telling you, you guys, healing is possible. There is some horrific stuff that has gone on, not only in my life, like that's only my perspective, but I meet brave, amazing humans every day that have survived horrific circumstances. And they have gone on to heal and help others. And I'm telling you, it's possible. And you're not precluded from that. You're not the one person in the whole world that is not going to heal and not going to be able to help other people if that's what you choose to do. It's just, that's not the case. It's not the truth. So we're going to kill all of the little gremlins and the little inner critics. We're going to just silence all of them. And just, just remember, like, I believe you and I believe in you. And you have an entire community in over 180 countries that show up here every single week to support one another. And they're in groups and they're keeping in touch and they're meeting up with one another at, at someone's house or they're you know planning meetups they're they're going to have coffee they're they're texting they're skyping they're facebook messaging whatever like there is a community of people that value you as a human and that believe you and you're not alone there is hope there's healing and there's help so there, that was pretty encouraging. <laughs> I, I wish someone would have said that to me back in the beginning. <laughs>
<laughs> that would have really helped me a lot. So um, that's it for now, guys. Two hours, OMG. Um, I didn't mean to scare people away. It's not ever two hours, trust me. <laughs> but I look forward to seeing you next Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Oh, and I, I honestly think that the survey, the poll on my Twitter feed is over now. I think it's too late. But I have one last poll. So let me see if I can uh, let me see if I can get this really quick, really quick. Here we go. Um, let's see. Okay. Oh boy, that was weird. Let's see if I can find. Here we go. Nope, that's not it. Uh, let's see. File new window. Yay! Hopefully you can see that. Um, let's see. Twitter. Yay! Okay, so here on my profile, new poll, and it's all done. My final results here, the last time it was 100 and something, and it was like 60% CPTSD over everything else. And now it's 60% CPTSD over everything else. If you guys could stay tuned, stay tuned for one more poll. Because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to narrow down the content that I produce for you guys. And I want to make sure it's content that you want. So far, CPTSD wins. Everybody that's on this channel and that follows me on social wants me to create daily CPTSD resources. Um, but I'm going to do one more poll just to make sure. So um, please, between now and next Monday, <laughs> um, go over on my Twitter profile when I put a new poll up and, um, and weigh in and let me know your vote. It's anonymous. I'll never know. Um, but thanks for being here, you guys. You guys are amazing. You are what makes this community beautiful and healing. So um, I'll see you next Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Bye for now.